certainly on behalf of C21 and campus ministry, welcome to Agape Latte. This is the final Agape Latte of this semester. We will start again in February of next semester. Again, welcome, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Stephen Pope is a professor in our theology department and truly a blessing to all of us here at Boston College. Professor Pope majored in philosophy and theology at Gonzaga University and went to receive his Master's of Divinity and a PhD in Ethics and Society from the University of Chicago and continues his exploration of theological ethics on campus. He brings a clear passion to love and solidarity with others in his work for justice inside and outside of the classroom. He works closely with the Pulse Program the Perspectives Program, and the Faith, Peace, and Justice Studies minor program here at BC. And he inspires his students to strive for justice and live a life of love in his classes. So please, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Stephen Pope. OK, hi, everybody. How's everybody? Good? Ready for some forgiveness? First, I have to make you feel guilty. Then we bring in forgiveness, and everybody has a good evening. No, I'm not going to make you feel guilty unless you want to. Um, but I thought I'd start with telling a few stories of people that I know, and then try to talk a little bit about what those mean to me. And then I'd like to have a lot of interaction with the group tonight, those of you that last. Uh, but I'm hoping to talk about 20 minutes and then see where you're coming from, what kind of questions you have about forgiveness. It's a really complex uh, topic. I don't think there's any, uh, really any rules about forgiveness. Uh, when you should forgive, who you should forgive, what stages you have to go through forgiveness. You read a lot about that ac academia, about stages, rules, and, and uh, sort of the grammar. What, what is it, when do you say forgiveness the right way? And I don't really go with those because there are always experiences in life that mess up your theories. And if you're very theory heavy, you tend to ignore the counterexamples. You just think about the theory. And I think we need to talk about people. Because my basic point here is that I think forgiveness is crucial for human relationships. And I would say I don't know of any relationship in anyone's life that doesn't ride on forgiveness. So I think we need to not think of forgiveness as an exceptional thing that we do, um, some kind of dramatic moment. Uh, I think really it's something we do a lot, and we have a lot of facility with, but we don't think about it. Um, but it's also one of the most difficult things we'll ever have to do. So it's a paradox. It's extremely easy many times. It's extremely difficult at others. And probably when it's the hardest is when we most need to do it. And so I want to give the two stories I'm going to talk about. First, um, a guy called Seamus was at a parish. And I was giving a talk at a parish. And it was around uh, Lent. And I was speaking about sin and forgiveness. And Seamus came up to me. He was about 80 years old and uh, very old. Uh, from he came, his, he's the first generation American. His parents came from Ireland, and uh, he told me, "I wish I'd heard that story, uh, that, that talk, 65 years ago." And I said, "Why?" And he said, "Because when I was 15 years old, um, I left my house because my brother kept beating me up." And I told my parents, and my father said, I got to toughen up. My mother had eight kids. She had no time to pay attention to me crying. She was trying to work two jobs. She was a maid. She was a waitress. She couldn't possibly be my counselor. And I kept telling my brother to stop it. He was a lot bigger than I was. And he was a lot stronger. And he was older. And one day I said, I've had it. I had beaten, beaten up again. I was humiliated. I left the house in tears. I never came back to my house. I said, I talked to my parents, I talked to my other siblings, but from that day, I never spoke a word to my brother. So you can imagine how bad his pain was. It wasn't physical pain, it was emotional pain, the emotional trauma. So he said then, about a month ago, Seamus talked to me now, about a month ago, my sister called me and said, I ought to go see John. He's in the hospital and he's dying of cancer. He's 83 years old. So Seamus is going back and forth. Should I see him? Should I stay here? 
and he didn't know what to do. And he thought, okay, I'll go see him. And then he pulled back. He said, if I go there and I say, how are you, John? He said, I know he'll just insult me again. So I thought, I can't go face that humiliation. So he said, I'm not going to go. Then he said, I got to go. It's my only brother in the world. I got all these sisters. I got to see my brother. I've got to see him, and I've got to take the risk. No, I can't. I'm too afraid. So finally he goes back and forth, back and forth for three or four days. He finally goes to the hospital, and he goes to his brother's room, and his brother's not there. He had died a few hours ago, and he went too late. And he said to me, I wish I had not been so unwilling to forgive. I wish I had not been so feeling so hurt myself that I couldn't put the relationship ahead of my hurt. He says, I've been carrying the burden around my entire life, and it would have been the time for me to be free of this anger toward my brother. And he says, I'm still carrying it today. Because I never got to talk to him personally. He says, I've gone to confession, and I've been absolved, but I still have the feeling. So Sometimes we can feel forgiven in some way and intellectually, but we don't feel it in our hearts. So the second story I'll tell you is a positive story. That's a cautionary tale. This is a positive story about a woman who I met in South Africa a few years ago at a conference in Cape Town. She's a South African woman named Jen Fourier. You can look up her story on the web. It's really interesting. I met her at a conference. I was very impressed. Jin Fourier was uh, a South African whose daughter was going to the University of Cape Town. She was 23 years old, and she was at the Heidelberg Tavern on December 30th, 1993, when uh, three armed men came in the armed wing of the African National Congress came into the tavern. And at that time, the South African government was in negotiations with the ANC. And so there were people trying to provoke violence in order to, to break up the peace treaty, the, the peace uh, negotiations. So they burst, these three men burst into the Heidelberg Tavern, threw hand grenades, and sprayed it with uh, AK-47 fire. And they killed a number of people, one of whom was Jen Fourier's daughter, Lindy. And Lindy was the apple of her eye. Uh, for one thing, she looked just like Jin. And they were very close. It was a close family. She loved her daughter immensely, as any of your parents love you. And she got a phone call that night that her daughter was killed by guerrillas in this uh, military action. It wasn't military because it was against civilians. They were just college kids drinking in Marianne. It was a version of Marianne's. If you think there's more than one, there are. And so the, there was a tremendous shock, and of course she's angry, she's furious at this. If you're going to shoot soldiers, shoot soldiers, but don't shoot my 23-year-old my daughter. Well, in the South African process of uh, peace, they arranged for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, in which a formula was agreed that you speak truth about what you did during the war, the violence you did, and you'll be given amnesty called Truth for Amnesty. The three men that killed her daughter and many others were actually convicted in South African courts before the treaty, and sentenced to 25 years uh, in prison. But then they went before the Truth and Reconciliation Amnesty Committee, and they were given amnesty. She came to the committee hearing. And she said in the amnesty hearing, in front of the judges, these men should be freed because they have agree to the terms of our treaty that we need for peace in South Africa. Too many millions of people have died to let this continue. We have to all do our part. I will do my part with one, one request. I want to hear from these men. Do they feel sorry for what they did to my daughter? Do they feel contrition? Do they know how they broke my heart? I want them to know the pain I've been in since that happened. And so those men stood in front of the amnesty committee, and they told her that from hearing her talk about what happened to her daughter, they were deeply sorry. Now, of course, you might be thinking in the back of your mind, maybe this was just an act for the, for the TV cameras, 
They didn't have to say that because as long as you spoke the truth, you didn't have to feel contrition to be given amnesty. You did not have to be contrite, but they were. There's another wrinkle to this, though, which is that she realized these are the trigger men and that the commander that ordered that operation was never brought before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He was never convicted of a crime of murder. He was never made accountable. He never even agreed he did anything wrong. And the record was there who did it. She's riding down the road one day, and she hears on their version of National Public Radio this commander who is promoting a book that he wrote about his experience of a, as a commander in the ANC armed wing. And she says, she hears the story about this guy's going to appear at such and such a bookstore. On such and such a date, she writes it down. She goes to the bookstore. And this man goes and promotes his book. And she stands up in a room just like this, full of people. She stands up in the back and says, excuse me. But I would like to know why you don't take responsibility for the people that you killed who were innocent. And he was taken aback. He said because he thought of himself as a soldier fighting a war. And people, innocent people die in a war. She was collateral damage. That's the language that we use when we talk about killing Afghan civilians by drones. That we don't mean to kill them. We're trying to get the Taliban leader, but we get the civilians instead, or in addition to the, the, the military target. So he's thinking all the time, this is a justifiable killing. And then when she stands up and says this, he says, I will talk to you after I finish this speech. He wanted to have time to think, right? I'll talk to you after this. Thank you for your question. But he was kind about it. He wasn't dismissing her. She stays afterwards. They sit down at the table. They talk for a few hours. During the course of which, she basically tells him how much pain she's been in, how hurt she's felt. And his response to her was, I never realized the damage that I did to you. And I'm deeply sorry. He was able to go from thinking of this as a statistic of war to real life by hearing her story. He was able to, for the first time, feel contrition, feel sad and remorseful for what he did, feel the evil of his own action. She accepted his heartfelt apology. And in fact, together they said, what are we going to do to make right some of the bad, the wrong that's been done? We can't reverse history, but what can we do to promote peace in South Africa? So they actually formed an organization together, the two leaders who were enemies. And their job is to go around the world speaking to groups of high school students and in churches and synagogues about the need for peace, about reconciliation, and about forgiveness. So they turned this pain into an avenue of healing for both of them. They turned the denial into an avenue of honesty. They turned enmity and hatred into friendship. Isn't it odd that this happened from people with such different backgrounds and it couldn't happen in Seamus's family? When the gaps are not so distant, when the harm was not as grievous, when the pain is not as deep as losing someone. And in fact, your choice is to say they're dead to me the rest of my life when they're not dead at all and they don't have to be. So those two stories uh, pose for me the question, or I bring up the question, why bother? Why didn't he bother? Why didn't Seamus bother? It's because he felt pain. He felt fear. Is it going to happen again? If I go to speak to him, forget about forgiving. If I even go to speak to him, is he going to shame me again? Is he going to put me down? There's an inability to trust, which it makes a lot of sense. You only get beat up so much, right? So a lot of things got in his way. Why did she bother? Why did Jean Fourier bother to forgive? And I think she recognizes and learned from this experience. It reinforced her very deeply in this conviction that Forgiveness is necessary. She started, interestingly, from the geopolitical perspective. Forgiveness is necessary for our country. 
for us to come together. We can't be captive to the past. We can't be fated to thinking that our relations are going to be the relations of racial hatred and the, the, the result of colonialism and racism and slavery. One of the most horrendous regimes of all time is the apartheid regime. How do we get over that? Well, each person has to take a role. Each person has to take responsibility. We can't just say, let the government do it. Let the churches do it. Let the NGOs do it. Let the UN do it. We have to all be involved. So she went from the general view to saying, I have to apply this in my life. I have to walk the walk. Which means here and now, I have to reach out to this guy. She didn't start by saying, you owe me an apology. She started by saying, do you know the damage you've done? You're talking about how great the war was that we ended apartheid, but look at the damage you did that didn't have to be done to people. You're not just a victim, man. You are also a perpetrator. Well, that takes some guts, too, on her part. But then she came to realize in this process, it's good for him to be in a process of forgiveness. Why? Because it's helping him become more accountable. It's helping him become more honest. It's helping him become a better human being. You can only be a better person if you're more honest. My personal conviction is that becoming a better person involves two things, and they simultaneously help each other, compassion and honesty. That every time you're more compassionate, you're becoming a better person. Every time you're being more honest, you're becoming a better person, if you're doing it with compassion. So she realizes it's better for him. Then she realizes, hey, it's better for me. She says, after I've gone through this process with him, I felt like a backpack of bricks were taken off my shoulders. And I didn't even know it. Jean Fourier's husband became an alcoholic because of this killing of his daughter. He couldn't handle it in any way. And his answer was to go home and drink every night. It made him more racist, not less. It made him think the ANC government is simply railroading the white population and giving exoneration to all these people that did the killing. It's very interesting to me how suffering can either make you transcend yourself and become a better person, or suffering can harden yourself and make you a smaller person. It expanded her heart. I think it shrank his heart. And I don't know why. I'm not saying that in a way to blame him, because I think there's a mystery about how each of us responds to life's crises that you can't just dissect like you're dissecting that frog in sophomore biology. We don't know. But I can tell you, their relationship got really strained because she's going around with the guy that ordered his, the action that led to his daughter's death. And he's saying, you're picking him over me. She's saying, no, you're welcome to join us, but you have to come with an attitude of forgiveness and understanding, at least if you can't forgive, understanding. He's trying to improve. He's trying to be responsible. You have to give him credit for striving to be a better person than he was. So she realized it's better for the country. It's better for uh, him. It's better for her. But it was damaging to their marriage. There's a cost to forgiveness sometimes. Just like there's a cost anytime you do what's right. And it may have been that the relationship was already weak, and this put a burden on it that showed the strains that were already there. But it certainly didn't help. But her dedication to this was really that it's going to promote the good as much as possible. And maybe by now their marriage has gotten better and stronger. So why bother? I think we bother because there is no friendship. There is no relationship that's not based on forgiveness. When I say based on, I don't mean, let me try to find somebody I can be friends with that I can forgive. What I mean is, no relationship gets held together without forgiveness. What do I mean by forgiveness? The word to me means a million things. There's no one orthodox definition, but I think for me what it means is, you go from anger and hostility to somebody to choosing to want what's good for them. You will what's good to that person. It takes a lot to be a forgiving person. 
You have to have courage. You have to have strength to be able to forgive. So Seamus didn't have the courage because he'd been so hurt he didn't want to be vulnerable again. I think you have to have humility. Because the more you recognize you've offended other people, you've hurt other people in your life, the more willing you are to see that you need forgiveness too. We all need forgiveness. Every human being needs forgiveness. So there's no, there's the righteous and the unrighteous. That just does not work. There are those who know they're unrighteous and those who think they're righteous. But we're all in the same swampy mess. We need forgiveness. I think it also takes uh, patience. Because whenever you've been really hurt, it's not an act of forgiveness that does it. You don't just flip a switch or punch the microwave on for 30 seconds and it's all set. It's a process that takes choices over and over and over to forgive. But you've got to start sometimes, and sometimes when you start, it doesn't go off very well. So in starting the process, you realize it can be very difficult, and you have to keep up at it, and that's the patience part. Um, a few questions come up. Should you forgive yourself? And I have, um, I have some good friends who are inmates in the prison in MCI Norfolk in Massachusetts, in medium security prison. A number of them are in for murder, and they're there for life. And what they've told me over and over again is how painful it is for them not to be able to apologize to the people that they've hurt in their actions. Because the inmates are to have no contact with the families of the victims that they've been put in prison for, harming. And so they have no way to express how awful they feel about what they've done. The penitentiary is a place initially, you probably know this, but initially the penitentiary was erected in the 19th century by Quakers on the model of a monastery in which inmates have would be like monks, they have cells. And the Quaker idea was, put a person who's been a wrongdoer in a cell by themselves, and their greatest punishment is for them just to think about the crime that they did, just to, to meditate on their own wrongdoing. That's punishment that would be worse than any physical punishment you could do. Unfortunately, the criminal justice system now is set up such that the, the cell is a place you're put by adversaries in the criminal justice system who are out to get you. So the cell actually now functions for a lot of inmates to make them feel more victims than perpetrators. But in the case of the guys that I know in Catholic chaplaincy there, they've really come to terms with what they've done. They have a tremendous sense of contrition and guilt. And it's just like the case I mentioned earlier, the person, these guys go to confession but they still carry the load. They still have those bricks on their back. They would like at least to say, I'm deeply sorry for what I did to your family. They wouldn't even have the nerve to ask for an apology. They'll tell you, I don't deserve, an, I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve forgiveness, but I want to apologize. I want them to know how deeply bad I feel about what I did that night. And it's almost always at night, and it's almost always after drugs or alcohol. One bad night, and the rest of your life you spend in the penitentiary. So they're coming along to the point of saying, you know, they tell each other this, and the chaplains tell them, I tell them, you're never going to hear from the families. We forgive you. But you've been as contrite as a person can be. You need to be able to accept God's forgiveness in your life. And you need to accept forgiveness for yourself. It's not self-exoneration. Self-exoneration says, I'm really the victim here. I didn't do anything wrong. It's excuse making. They're fully accepting of their responsibilities, but they hate themselves for what they've done. Forgiving yourself says, I'm not going to hate myself anymore. I'm going to accept that I have dignity as a human being. And that I'm not reducible to the worst thing I've ever done in my life. I did that. That was me. But I renounced that 
and I renounce that me. I think in a smaller scale, we all need to go through a process of getting, uh, uh, showing our contrition to the people that we hurt, and also acknowledging that we're better than that worst thing we've ever done or that bad thing that we did. And it could be smallish things like telling rumors about people or making fun of people when they're not there or mocking people in a subtle way even when they are there. It can be, you know, being mean to somebody you're dating, betraying the person you're dating, which is very painful. It could be worse things that happen on this campus. That leads to the next question I want to talk about. I'll just talk for about three more minutes. Does forgiveness get rid of justice? I don't think forgiveness is a replacement for justice. I think forgiveness and justice reinforce each other because they both depend upon honesty about what happened. A guy on this campus who date rapes a student, I've seen this happen, can continue to control that student when she lives her whole life of fearing him's around the next corner or fearing meeting him in the library or fearing seeing him down here drink, getting coffee. If she can't, she needs to report the incident. Both for her own self-respect and to stop this guy from doing it to other girls in campus. Justice is crucial. We have a toleration of this behavior here in many college campuses that is totally unacceptable. That having been said, if he's made accountable, and if he is removed from Boston College, and maybe even does jail time, do you think she should forgive that guy? I think that question is very loaded. Should. Should. Because it makes it forgiveness an obligation. And I don't think forgiveness should be an obligation we put on someone. Because that means if you don't do it, you're guilty. I think forgiveness is something that we want to think about inviting ourselves to do if we can. For our own sake. To not be carrying that backpack around. Do not be living the rest of your life with the anger that Seamus had toward his brother. To not be feeling a grudge that wants someone to be harmed. Because I think that can be destructive for you. I would never tell that girl, you should forgive. I would never tell her, you shouldn't forgive. I would say that's her choice. But that she has to think about how she wants to think about that event for the rest of her life. And somehow to me, the healing that she has to go through has to be able to say that happened to me, but it doesn't define me. I had a student here who lived in Newton. And this is a strange thing for Newton, but she was the victim of a home invasion where guys, two guys went into her, broke her door down, went into her, they duct taped her, tied her to a chair, and they robbed her of everything she had. They didn't hurt her physically, thank God. Besides that, she wasn't sexually assaulted. But she came to my class afterwards, and she was trembling. Obviously, she's totally traumatized from this event. She was trembling. I thought that because of the way she was responding, that the event had happened last weekend. But it happened a month before we talked. But the memory was so vivid, and the pain was so powerful that she couldn't not live in that moment. So of course, you have to. I referred her to a, a counselor on campus, and she got some therapy. And I don't know if that helped her. I think it might have helped her. She came to me because I'm not a counselor, and, I'm, and I couldn't possibly do that kind of work. But she came to me saying, "You know, you're in Christian ethics. How can you talk about forgiveness? I want to forgive, but I can't. I want to forgive, but I don't. I don't feel the, the possibility of doing that. I think forgiveness." As I said, it's a process. And what I told her was, you can't rush the process. First, you have to take care of yourself. You have to be whole yourself. 
You forgive out of strength. You don't forgive out of intimidation. You don't forgive out of fear. You don't forgive out of terror. But when and if you can forgive, it'll be because you've gone through the healing process. In your, in your ability to say, I'm not going to let that control the rest of my life. I'll end with one more story, which is of a student, as some of you know here, uh, from Meg Battle, who graduated a few years ago. Fantastic human being. Scary human being. Uh, in the sense, I'm saying that, you don't know her, so I shouldn't be saying that. But I say it in a, in a laughing way because she was very unintimidated by anybody or anything. Um, Meg's at a party in the mods, senior year. A good guy friend of hers um, with other guys were sitting there drinking their buds or whatever, and she walks by, and he's laughing with his friends, and he bends over and he slaps her in the butt. Meg Battle does not brook fools easily. So for a split second, I think she was hesitant and embarrassed and didn't know what to do, but only for a split second. And then she wheeled on him like the turrets of a battleship wheeling on the next target in the South China Sea. And she let him have it verbally. You think you can do this because you're drinking. You think it's funny. But I know you, and you don't degrade women like that. You don't mock women like that. You don't treat women like a sexual object like that. And you're doing it because these jerks are here, and they're laughing at you doing it. You should be ashamed of yourself. So she completely dressed him down. And needless to say, he had zero comeback. He had no defense. He'd just been devastated verbally. But she didn't stop there. She left the party. She came back. She made lunch date with him the next day. And she went over maybe 45 minutes point by point of how what he did in that act was a complete violation of everything she understood about him, about the kind of person he was, the kind of values he had, about being Mr. FPJ, not Mr. F slap on the butt. And he realized that he made not just a big mistake in doing that, she helped him see that a lot of what he was doing in his life was a lot of words and not real. It was real, but it was, it was a gesture. It was kind of halfway there. It was an ideal that he had when he was in a good mood and full of caffeine, but full of beer and tired and wanting to just mess around, let loose. He was a different person. If she had just walked away and laughed and said, boys will be boys, he'd probably be doing that at his office party on Christmas. I bet you he's not anymore. Her having the courage to call him on it, both to, at the spot, but then later on to really speak to him calmly, respectfully, clearly. Her having the guts to do that help him become a better person and help her reaffirm her own dignity as a woman. That she wasn't be treated that way. That he wouldn't want his sister treated that way and he wouldn't want his mother treated that way. It helped him grow to be challenged. I say this story because I think a lot of times at BC, we have to put on this kind of image of being all together. And part of the image of being all together and being a perfect person is nothing really bothers me. Nothing really gets to me. Well, as a matter of fact, stuff really does bother us and stuff really does get to us. And we don't have to put up with it. It doesn't mean we have to go around ambushing people, right? But it does mean we have to have the courage to communicate. That, to me, is the core thing about bothering. It's, it's a bother because it's a pain in the butt to communicate with people sometimes. You have to get out of your comfort zone. You don't have control when you try to communicate with somebody because they might come back with something you can't anticipate. They might throw you off guard. But if you really love somebody, if you really care about them, you have to be willing to risk communication. You have to be willing to fly, flop on your face. But be honest about the flop. You know, try it. It's the only way in which relationships get stronger, and it's the only way in which each of us is going to grow as human beings. And I really think the purpose of BC is to help us grow as human beings in our minds, but also in our hearts and souls. And forgiveness to me is, the, is a central part of what it means to grow, to be an adult person, to be a responsible person.